You are clear for launch. And with that, shut down your visors. O2 on and prepare for ignition, 202. Copy that, and, um... It's Mr. Rushoff again. All right, so far we've gone over the essentials of geography, we've covered the elements of physical geography, and we have examined how human geography helps explain the world around us. This lesson begins our first unit in which we're going to use all of what we've learned so far and start applying it to the ground. In each of these regional geography units, we're going to begin by looking at the landforms and the waterways that we find in each one of these regions. Now, these are important as they will help explain the factors that help shape settlements and the economic development of each one of these regions. In our first regional unit, we're going to start right at home with the United States and Canada. And I know what you're thinking, what about Mexico? Yes, Mexico is part of North America along with the United States and Canada, but we're going to look at Mexico when we study Latin America because the Mexican story is much closer aligned with the Spanish experience in Central and South America. So let's look at the United States and Canada, and first we need to orient ourselves. Now you should already know that the United States and Canada is found in the northern and the western hemispheres. And we're also bounded by four major bodies of water. The Atlantic Ocean is off the east coast, the Pacific is off the west coast, to the north is the Arctic Ocean, and then down to the south we have the Gulf of Mexico. Now where we're going to begin our story is off the east coast of the continent, and then we're going to travel west, explaining each landform and waterway as we go. And when we move from the Atlantic Ocean, we first find the Atlantic Coastal Plain, or along the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Coastal Plain. This area is generally wet with many smaller rivers, marshes, and swampland. A lot of swampland, which means that this area really hasn't really been great for good agriculture. Now, as we move further inland from the Atlantic Coastal Plain, we run into our first mountain range, the Appalachians, which starts in, all the way down south in Alabama and stretches all the way up to the northeast portions of Canada. Now, created through convergent folding some 480 million years ago, these are old mountains. And through all the weathering and erosion has occurred over these last 480 years, they've been worn down to an average of just about 300 feet in elevation. They're really not that very tall. Now, despite not being very tall, they did actually form as an obstacle for settlers as they were moving to the west. Now, between the coastal plain and the Appalachians, we find what is known as the Piedmont, which literally is the foothills of the Appalachians. The Piedmont is a low rolling plateau with several rivers that cut through it that have made the region a fertile agricultural area. It is in the Piedmont that cotton was plentiful in the southern portions of the Piedmont and the northern Piedmont, tobacco and fruit was raised very abundantly. Now, as the waters out of the Appalachians flow through the Piedmont, there will be waterfalls where the water will plunge to lower elevations. The imaginary lines that connect these waterfalls of these rivers is called the fall line. Now, since waterfalls prevented ships from moving any further inshore, farmers would take their goods to the waterfalls in order to load them onto ships. This led to towns and then cities being formed near these waterfalls. Today, some of the major Southern American cities can be found upon this fall line. Now, west of the Appalachians, we find the interior plains, which are often known as the interior lowlands. This plain of rolling hills extends from Texas all the way up to northern Canada. Now, to the south of the interior plains, we find the interior highlands. These are ancient mountains that were used to be part of the Appalachians and Texas's Marathon Mountains. Today, these highlands are known as the Ozarks in Missouri or the Washitas in Arkansas. Now, in Canada, the interior plains become the Canadian Shield. This large rock plateau covers the eastern half of Canada and contains some of the oldest rock that be found in the world, dating all the way back 2 billion years. It is in this ancient rock that we can find some of the oldest evidence of early life on Earth. Now, the Canadian Shield wraps around the southern half of what is known as Hudson Bay. Named by Sir Henry Hudson, who discovered it in 1610, Hudson Bay was key to early Canadian development as the British found that the bay allows for access to the rich fur resources of the Canadian Northwest. Now, as we move from Hudson Bay down to the south along the border between the United States and Canada, we find the Great Lakes, which are great indeed. These five lakes, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, Lake Michigan, and Lake Erie, contain nearly 20% of all the fresh surface water in the world. Now, let me put this another way. If you took all the water that's in the Great Lakes and just dumped it on the lower 48 American states, it would cover the states with nine and a half feet of water. 
that's a lot of water. Now, beyond the amount of water, what is important about the Great Lakes is they are all connected to each other. You can sail a ship from one lake to another lake to another lake, except for, well, actually Lake Ontario. Now, Lake Ontario is actually connected by water to Lake Erie. However, between the two lakes, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, lies Niagara Falls. These waterfalls have over 3,100 tons of water flows over those falls every second, making it, well, pretty much impossible to sail over. Well, impossible at least to sail twice over. You could go over once, but you're not gonna like the impact. Now, to solve this problem with Niagara Falls, in 1829, the Wheeland Canal was finished that bypassed the falls and gave ships a safe way to pass from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie and thus to the rest of the Great Lakes. Now, this became what is part of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Now, the St. Lawrence River opens up into the Atlantic within the Canadian province of Quebec and flows all the way to Lake Ontario. This means that a ship from anywhere in the world can enter the St. Lawrence River, flow to, to Lake Ontario, go through the Welland Canal to Lake Erie, and then go into the interior of the North American continent. It should be no wonder that Canada's largest cities are found along the St. Lawrence Seaway. Now, the American answer to the St. Lawrence Seaway was the Erie Canal and the Hudson River. Entering the Atlantic at New York City, the Hudson River flows north into the state. In 1821, the Erie Canal was completed that connected the, this Hudson River to Lake Erie. Now, the Americans had their own seaway from the Atlantic that could be able to go through all the the Great Lakes all the way west as far as Duluth, Minnesota. This vital seaway is one of the reasons why nearly all of New York's largest cities, to include New York City, was developed along this trade route that opened up due to the Hudson River and the Erie Canal. Now, another incredible waterway is the Mississippi River. Now, forming the Mississippi River Delta that is in the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River flows generally straight north all the way up to Minnesota. The Mississippi River is the central river of the Mississippi River Basin, which pretty much drains all the area between the Appalachians and the Rocky Mountains. Now, the Mississippi River provides ship travel into the heartland of the continent, and when the Illinois and Michigan Canal was opened up, the Mississippi River was able to go through the canal into the Great Lakes as well. Now, there are two major tributaries that flow into the Mississippi River, the Ohio that runs from the east and the Missouri that flows in from the west. Now, some of the largest American cities were founded on these river shores. While it is not nearly as large as the Mississippi River, the Rio Grande River also plays a significant role to play. First, it forms the natural boundary between the United States and Canada. It also has deposited lots of fertile alluvial soil. So just like the Mississippi River, the Rio Grande has made the area around it a important agricultural area. Now, as we move a little bit further west, in the center of the continent flowing from Texas all the way up to Canada, we find the Great Plains. This is a broad, flat, and fertile area that was once known as the Great American Desert because this area receives less than 20 inches of rain each year. However, this steppe is one of the world's most important agriculture areas. As 80% of the land area of the Great Plains is actually used for agriculture, this area is known as the nation's breadbasket. Over 50% of the nation's wheat comes from this region, as does a significant portion of the country's sorghum, barley, cotton, and corn. As the Great Plains go into Canada, it goes into what is known as the Prairie Provinces. These actually serve as Canada's own breadbasket, growing half of Canada's food. However, these provinces also provide Canada with over half its minerals and natural resources to include a great deal of oil. Now, west of the Great Plains, we find the majestic Rocky Mountains. Now, these are far younger than the Appalachians and they haven't been eroded as much. Therefore, the Rockies are not only the longest, but they're the tallest mountain range in North America and with peaks as high as 20,000 feet. Now, the Rockies stretch from New Mexico and the United States all the way up into Canada and Alaska. And it is in Alaska we find North America's tallest peak, Mount Denali, towering at 20,310 feet. Now, along the crest of the Rockies is where we find the Continental Divide. This line divides the watershed of the North American continent. Any rain that falls on the west of this line will flow into the Pacific Ocean, and any water that falls on the east of this line will flow into either the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. 
Now, along the west coast of North America, we find what is known as the Pacific Mountain System. The Pacific Mountain System is North America's part of the Ring of Fire. No, 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 not that Ring of Fire, this Ring of Fire. Remember, the Ring of Fire is the subduction zone that surrounds the Pacific Ocean, is where we find 90% of all the world's earthquakes and 75% of the world's volcanoes. The Pacific Mountain System is actually made up of several other mountain ranges that include the Alaska Range, which is actually part of the Rockies, but we also have the Coast Range that stretches down the coast from Alaska all the way down to California. Now, while the Coast Range is along the Pacific Ocean, as we go inland, we find the Cascades in Washington and Oregon. The Cascade Range is home of major volcanoes such as Mount St. Helens that erupted in 1980 and had several smaller eruptions between 2004 and 2008. Now, if we go down to California, there is the Sierra Nevadas, which includes Mount Shasta, which is another volcanic mountain. Now, it is in between the mountain ranges of the Pacific Mountain System that we can see the rain shuttle effect at work. This map shows the precipitation averages for the Pacific Northwest. Now, you're going to see that there are two strips of areas where there is a great amount of rain. And just to the east of these, you can see that the climate is much drier. These areas of increased rainfall lines up with the windward sides of the coast and Cascade Mountains, which block rain from reaching further into the east. This is a perfect example of the rain shuttle effect. Now, another such example is the Great Basin, which sits between the Sierra Nevadas and the Rocky Mountains. Now, blocked by these mountains to the east and to the west, the Great Basin is an air arid area that includes Death Valley. Death Valley is not only the lowest part in the Western Hemisphere at 282 feet below sea level, this dry spot is also the hottest place in North America, once registering a temperature of 134 degrees. And trust me, that's hot. Now, the Great Basin is also home to the Great Salt Lake. This lake is the last remaining part of a prehistoric lake once known as Lake Monteville, which once covered what was today western Utah. Though today it is one of the top 10 most saltiest lakes in the world. Now to give you an idea how salty it is, our oceans average about 3.5% salt. The Great Salt Lake, however, measures up to 27% salt. The reason it's so salty is that water flows into it from the Rockies and Sierra Nevadas, but water has nowhere else to go. It just sits there. So as the lake water evaporates, the minerals, including salt that washed down from the mountains, settles, increasing the salinity of the lake. Okay, so we have crossed our continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and we identified the major mountains, the plateaus, and the rivers that have shaped our lives in the United States and Canada. In our next lesson, we'll take a look at the climate of the United States and Canada and some of the types of extreme weather that we find here. But until then, keep on learning.